Vincent O'Toole, welcome to 7.30. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here in Australia. You wrote an essay recently predicting the dissolution of the United Kingdom. Has that become inevitable, do you think? I suppose nothing is inevitable in history, but if you stand back from why the United Kingdom was formed in the first place and you look at you know, the importance of Protestantism to it as, as, as a binding force, you look at the Industrial Revolution, you look at empire, um, you know, all of these things are gone. Uh, so, so, so many of the things that actually made the UK viable and necessary um, just are not factors anymore. And, you know, it's very hard to see over the long term uh, that it's going to continue to exist in the shape it does now. Who knows what shape it may take in the future. But it, it's very hard to see, for example, that Northern Ireland will still be in the UK in, in 15 or 20 years' time. Scotland, obviously, is, is uh, you know, roiled by the question of independence. Even Wales, you know, the, the, the nationalist movement in Wales has got stronger and stronger. And, of course, we have English nationalism, you know, which manifested itself in Brexit. You know? So there are all these forces that are pulling it apart, I think. Let, let me ask you about that. I mean, how much has this been caused by the unleashing of the animal spirits of nationalism that we saw around Brexit? You know, uh, I think Brexit is, is, is both a symptom and a cause, you know. So it's, it's a symptom of the way in which all of us in the British Isles kind of ignored English nationalism. So if we'd been having this conversation 10 years ago, we would have been talking about Scotland and Ireland and Wales, but we wouldn't have been talking about England. Uh, and this is strange, of course, because uh, we know that the English have a very strong national identity. And yet there's no expression of it. There's no parliament. There's no national theatre. That's an English theatre. You know, there's, there's very little that's actually, you know, connected to the English sense of, its, the sense of themselves. And the only thing that really come, was offered to give expression to this was Brexit, which, of course, doesn't really answer any questions about, uh, about the UK's future. Uh, but it, it seems to provide some sort of outlet through which this sort of English nationalism could express itself. And, of course, now Brexit is, is um, a, a large disappointment, even to many of the people who voted for it. So we don't really know where all that pent-up energy uh, and, and dissatisfaction is going to go next, but it certainly hasn't gone away. Now, oddly, you don't see this, see these forces um, moving away from, from England and London. You don't see this as automatically leading to a united Ireland. Why not? So the long-term uh, direction of travel, I think, is towards a united Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland no longer has a Protestant majority, uh, that's what it was set up to have. <laughs> what you have in Northern Ireland now at the moment is you have neither a Catholic nor a Protestant majority. Uh, you, you have really the, those two blocks, but then you've got in, an increasing number of people in the middle, uh, particularly young people who do not identify uh, with those terms, do not identify with being either nationalist or unionists, and who are open to persuasion. I mean, they actually see themselves as saying, OK, well, talk to me about this. You know, t tell me what kind of offer there is for United Ireland. And this is the problem, I think, that that offer hasn't really been made yet. So if you ask most people in the Republic of Ireland, would you like a United Ireland? They say yes. And then you say, well, OK, what would you do for it? What's the deal? Would you pay higher taxes? You know, would you have a new national anthem, you know, <laughs> new flag? What kind of political arrangements? People just don't know. And my worry would be that we, you know, if, if this was pushed too quickly, it could be another Brexit, you know, where you have this, this big proposition and you have a vote on it. And then everybody thinks, OK, what does it mean? What, what did we actually vote for? Uh, let's just talk about what just happened, which was we saw the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. He reached a deal with the EU to resolve the hugely complex border issue with Northern Ireland created by Brexit. That's just so we're all... We all know what we're talking about. But this is my question, Finton. How did Sunak, with a straight face, manage to congratulate Ireland for ending up with the best of both worlds, effective EU membership, along with its association with the UK, which, of course, is what everyone in the UK had 
before Brexit? I mean, I, I think he, he, he described Northern Ireland as the most exciting economic zone in the world <laughs> because it has access to both the British and European markets. Uh, and exactly as you say, uh, you know, whoever thought that would be possible? <laughs> you know, is that not what you had for 50 years uh, and that you, that you dumped, you know, very deliberately chose to do so? And I think this absurdity really shows the strange way in which this huge Brexit project, I mean, the biggest single thing that Britain has done politically for, for 50 years, has sort of just, it's like a big balloon that has just burst, you know. It, it, it has no real purchase on anything anymore. It, it doesn't really have very much meaning. Um, it's not a political project that's really going anywhere. And the Northern Ireland Protocol deal that Sunak did, and to his credit, he did do the deal, and, and, and he's kind of, looks like he's going to face down the, the opposition to it. Uh, it, it just it sort of ends the story. The, the, there's no more grievance to be squeezed out of, you know, Britain against Europe. And so where are they left? I mean, they're left with actually slowly having to rebuild relations with Europe and to move back into perhaps an ever closer relationship with the EU. Um, so it, it, it's a very, even for people who voted for Brexit, you know, a lot of them are asking this question, I mean, was all of this worth it? So a world of unintended consequences. In the meantime... Um, the Good Friday Agreement still looms as the most important guiding document. Where will it lead the Irish people? Well, you know, it, it, the, the Good Friday Agreement is still an, a remarkable achievement. It has, broadly speaking, the, the piece that was done in 1998 has made the 21st century very different for the whole islands of Ireland. And it's, it's left us in a situation where we're beginning to get to a point where Irish identity has to be plural, uh, you know. So it's not even anymore about a united Ireland, which implies some kind of monolith, you know. It's, it's about sharing space. And, and uh, you know, I, I think over the rest of my lifetime, however long that's going to be, uh, for all the difficulties, I think we are going to see a much more open sense of, of, of what that shared space means uh, and of being able to genuinely reconcile. And on the basis of reconciliation, then you can build new political arrangements. You shouldn't do it the other way around. You can't impose a political deal on people um, who still you know, haven't fully thought through what their own identity is. Fintan O'Toole, a great pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.